Hey, good evening. This is uh, Colonel Chris Ruge here with uh, Command Sergeant Major Rob Prizer from U.S. Army Garrison, Alaska. And uh, we just want to kind of talk to the community a little bit tonight about uh, some impacts of COVID as we get ready to go into the holidays and the winter. Um, and not to diminish the health uh, risks of COVID, but tonight we really kind of want to focus on the community impacts as a whole uh, from COVID. Um, we're having to do a lot of things different in, uh, in 2020 because of COVID. Um, and specifically as we start our, uh, start into the winter season and start holiday events and social gatherings, uh, that's going to mean some, some different things than we're used to doing. Sergeant Major is going to talk a little bit uh, more about our, uh, the Hall Halloween event coming up specifically. We did a walk through that today, and so Sergeant Major, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here. Um, if you have questions uh, while we're live here, please go ahead and send them in, and we will uh, try and answer uh, questions before we uh, go offline. If there's other uh, questions that pop up afterwards, um, please go ahead and send those in, and we will uh, we'll get those answered offline as well. Um, so, uh, the military, uh, you know, our military community um, is very tightly interconnected, uh, more than more so than you know community off post. Um, and personal decisions about COVID safety uh, impact our community because we're so tight knit. And the examples with that are that you know we have many many family members on this installation who are also employees on this installation. And uh, even if our employees, uh, family members slash employees, are incredibly diligent, uh, there's still a fair possibility that because of the inter close interconnectivity of the installation, that they're going to come in contact with. Uh, somebody who maybe isn't being quite as diligent um, and if not directly through their kids and so really what I'm you know, kind of asking tonight is that uh, we kind of focus on and understand the impacts of personal or individual decisions not to mask or to keep social distance and how those can affect the, uh, the installation as a whole so here's why it's important um, on post transmission for COVID can have huge impacts. Um, even a case or two can uh, cause us to curtail or shut down services. Um, most recently, a good example, uh, Ielsen Air Force Base uh, was forced to, forced to close their CDCs for two weeks. And I think they're, if I'm not mistaken, they're still closed at the moment because they had a family member who contracted COVID from a, another family member, um, and that fam and this family member who contracted it happened to be an employee at uh, their CDC, at the CDC, and because of where that employee worked, there were multiple close contacts within that CDC, ultimately making the Eielson Air Force Base uh, Child Development Center non-mission capable for a, a period of time during this uh, quarantine period for for these employees. So, we have been lucky. At Fort Wainwright, um, that is, we have been very, very close. It's a knife's edge um, to having similar scenarios here. Um, on one occasion, we had to close gyms early um, because of uh, COVID positive and subsequent, subsequent close contact quarantines. Um, and, and the next day, we we're able to rearrange staff and get back to normal services. Um, but on several other occasions. We have been very, very close. And if you watched a uh, video that I, I did last week, uh, Garrison Update, um, you, you heard me mention that we've had some low staff numbers and we're working on building our staffing back up after uh, summer PCS season for our, our uh, MWR facilities. It, so it doesn't take much to throw us into a scenario where we would have to curtail services. And it really, it's only been because of the dedication and flexibility of our employees, some very creative scheduling on behalf of supervisors and for the gyms, uh, the fact that 125 has, uh, and our teammates 125 have been incredibly generous in contributing to help uh, man, man the gyms um, while we are getting soldier, or getting uh, civilians hired so that we can have a sufficient uh, quantity of personnel to keep the gyms going. So that's, that's why it's so important. It doesn't take much. Um, and so I also mentioned last week that we're in the process of getting those additional recreation uh, uh, facilities open for the winter. So um, ice rink, uh, getting ice laid for um, over the ice rink, and we're probably delayed about another week for, for some parts, but it is, it is coming, and that will happen. Birch Hill, um, right after Thanksgiving, 
getting the aquatics center of the pool over at Malavin going as soon as we've got staffing and uh, getting uh, the Last Frontier uh, Conference Center uh, indoor playground um, going for the winter. Those are additional things that COVID cases, a one or two COVID cases in the wrong spot within our organization um, could throw any one of those off for an extended period of time and have ripple effects across the installation. And I know as we go into winter, uh, we are all very concerned with outlets and the mental health and the ability to get out and about. And so really what I, my message uh, tonight on this is please don't be that person that based on your uh, decision to consciously disregard COVID uh, safety measures inadvertently causes a negative uh, effect for the entire community for quality of life um, and morale, morale and welfare. Um, and if we all do this, we all take, uh, take the precautions, we decrease that uh, possibility immensely. Um, and, and that's really what we all want to do. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Sergeant Major uh, now, uh, talk a little bit about where we're seeing the COVID cases and Halloween, and then uh, we'll open up to questions if, if there are any. Thanks. Thank you, sir. So how are, how are the transmissions happening here at Fort Wayne, right? So with, within our community, we're currently seeing that most of the significant transmissions are centering around uh, dinner parties, social events that, that uh, have folks gathering, such as baby showers and birthday parties. For That's a big example. Um, and at these places, mask wearing and, and social distancing are not consistently happening. Uh, food and drink uh, are being consumed within pro close proximity to others. Um, and then obviously while you're consuming food, you're not wearing a mask. So it, it opens up your, your risk uh, at those types of events. And then also at uh, gatherings that are involving more than 10 people. Um, so those events can and obviously uh, over the last uh, week or so have uh, caused positive COVID cases to go up um, and it also includes dozens of folks who are mandatory ordered to go into quarantine based off of uh, being in close contact with somebody that was at one of those events. Uh, so if you're going to host a party or, a, or participate in an event, think about how it's going to go and how you're going to execute that so that you can do it safely. Uh, for example, keeping it under the 10, the 10 person requirement that right now we have under GO number one um, and keep it small enough so that participants can maintain six foot greater separation. Obviously wear masks and then consider not eating or if you're going to eat, spread folks out so that they can eat uh, in their own little bubble if you will so that you're not sitting right next to somebody else that's eating while you're not wearing a mask. Um, also have hand washing, hand sanitizer opportunities available for use. Uh, the, the bottom line is, is it, it, it's going to take all of us being vigilant in all aspects of our life in order to not allow this to, to spread like wildfire. So switching over to Halloween. So there continues to be a lot of questions uh, about Halloween and we recognize and we sympathize obviously that this is not going to be a normal Halloween and we all know that nothing in 2020 is normal. Um, so obviously Fort Wainwright is not doing the door-to-door -door trick or treating uh, this year and uh, we're asking the, the members of our community to refrain or minimize uh, the trick-or-treating off post uh, because of the risk that it poses to Fort Wainwright and the personnel that live here uh, as we go into the winter. And we all know that as we go into the winter, people tend to go indoors. Um, and if we're bringing uh, that, if we bring COVID in and we take it indoors, we're gonna spread it even faster. Uh, so earlier this week, the, the Surgeon General reiterated that you know, COVID can live on plastic for up to 72 hours um, on, and on your hands for up to nine hours. And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, putting a candy bowl out on the, uh, on the porch and letting the kids pick through it or whatever is not really recommended. Um, and it's pretty important that we don't do that kind of stuff. And while, like Colonel Ruga mentioned a, a few uh, town halls and stuff ago, we recognize that there are a lot of people that could go out and do all of this stuff and be absolutely safe, we cannot with 100% certainty guarantee that everybody will follow all the protocols and take it seriously. Uh, so for that, uh, you know, we're, we're asking that you participate in our, our other event. And 
in, in line with that, it's almost a certainty that the folks off post are not paying attention to what, what COVID will do and how it affects Fort Wainwright as a whole. Uh, they're not even taking that into account as they're, they're planning their events. So we, we ask that you refrain from going to those events if you can. And that's why Fort Wainwright is hosting our uh, Fort Wainwright Halloween drive through event on Saturday, um, where we have a little bit more control and we can mitigate uh, the COVID concerns by pre-packing candy. So the, the command group uh, did our pre-packing party a week and a half ago, and we got in here, separated uh, ourselves, and packed candy. Um, you, we can have touchless distribution of the candy uh, out at the event, and then we can ensure that all of our persons uh, that are operating that event are wearing masks and gloves. And then the added benefit to you is you and your kids don't have to be outside walking through the neighborhood. Um, only the, the hardcore folks that are out there handing out candy have to stand out in the cold. Um, I, I personally think that it's going to be a, a great event. The commander and I did a walkthrough of uh, the glass park the other day, or I said today, um, and kind of saw how, how we're going to lay everything out. Um, and we'll set it all up Saturday, and then we, we look forward to getting out there. So we will be out there with our families handing out candy. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, we'll see you out there. Happy Halloween, sir. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Sir Major. Brian, we got any questions out there? Yes, sir, we do. Okay. Uh, one is, how do we think influenza with the pandemic affect how supplies will be at the commissary during the holidays? Um, so I actually have not had that specific question that I've uh, posed to the, the commissary, but uh, you know, in previous conversations, I don't necessarily think that should change commissary uh, supplies. Um, you know, I think we, we are all aware in Alaska, and this even off post, um, the supplies can kind of hiccup uh, depending on what uh, shipment comes in or doesn't come in on any given uh, boat and subsequent truck. Um, and I would anticipate something similar to that. I don't think we're seeing uh, much more in the way of disruptions uh, related to COVID or anything else than we would typically see. We've definitely gotten past those uh, those early days of the spring where we were seeing uh, massive amounts of things missing off the shelves. Um, and, so, and so generally, I think stuff's coming in, um, at least and we shop at the commissary almost exclusively. And, and so I've got, I'm over there at least once a week. So pretty good pretty good feel that most of the shelves are, are full and continue to be that way five cases from a field exercise but we're not allowed to go out in town please shed some light on this so I think the cases from you know field exercise you know the ability to um, you know like units are testing um, and uh, when those folks come back, when units come back and they do additional testing, they are able to quarantine um, and sequester and kind of keep things um, pushed down. Uh, going out in town, and I think when you say go out in town, you're probably referring to eating out um, and going to bars, because those are really the only two things that we're prohibited to do, the soldiers are prohibited to do to go out in town. Um, really it comes back to, just like you said, there are cases that are happening even without that. And then if you take those and then you go out and you eat in social areas and, and with your mask off with groups of folks um, and have, you know, the possibility of spreading it even more is, is just so much more exponential. And so none of us are naive enough to think that we're not going to have any COVID, even with the best measures we have, it, it's going to happen. There's going to be some contact touch that somebody's going to inadvertently touch something and then touch their eye or do something like that. It, it is out there. It's going to happen. And we, but when it's small, we keep it tamped down. We can deal with that stuff. When it's folks going out and not wearing their mask and not uh, social distancing and eating and being in groups larger than you know than ten to where hey, if somebody were to get uh, we're positive, you're keeping the bubble relatively small, um, then <laughs> we're creating risk for the entire community. And we're creating the risk of one of those uh, folks being somebody who works on one of those critical facilities on the installation that all of us depend on, and then ultimately having those ripple effects. So, I mean, I, th I think that's, that ultimately gets to why it's so significant. 
on gym times accommodating working personnel is there a reason it is restricted during lunch hours and hours between 4 and 6 p.m.? Yeah, so the, the gym hours, so initially, if you uh, recall back early in, uh, in COVID, we, we did close the gyms to only service members. Um, and then we slowly identified some time periods where family members, where soldiers were not doing high utilization of, of the gyms. Um, and we opened those hours up to families. And then recently we did a, another review of utilization time frames, um, soldiers versus uh, when, when soldiers weren't using the gyms as much. And we expanded, and I don't recall the hours right off the top of my head, but we expanded um, a little bit more for, for family members. And so ultimately that's, that's where we're at. Is, I mean, our, one of our primary missions for the gyms is physical readiness. Um, and so that's why soldiers are prioritized. Uh, we absolutely recognize that we need the ability for family members to, to get into the gyms, especially during the winter months, and that's why we've taken that step to expand hours a little bit more. And we will continue to do that on a, on a periodic basis, uh, just like everything we've done during COVID has been a constant review. So um, please uh, stay tuned. And if you do have thoughts on different hours, if you do put an ICE comment in and you put, uh, put your contact information, um, we'll absolutely get back to you on you know where we're headed with specific ice or specific hours. Okay. Um, as far as the installation and planning, what steps are there for the morale and mental health, especially during COVID and Alaska winters? Uh, and on top of that, with the seasons and holidays coming up, uh, not being able to be around to others. Yeah, so I think that's going to be, that's, that's the challenge we're all facing, um, and it's finding those creative ways to do things. And Sergeant Major mentioned uh, some of them, is it's not saying you can't be social, it's having to think different about how you're, you're being social. And if you do decide to, uh, you know, go to somebody's house and, or host a gathering, making sure you can do it in a safe manner. And it may seem awkward to wear masks at your friend's house, but if that's what it is to protect the community, at least you're there, you're together, and you're able to talk uh, you know, in the same room. Um, I think in a lot of cases, that's probably better than, you know, for a lot of folks, being over the phone. Um, if, but if you're going to do that in those groups of less than 10, make those uh, safe choices. As far as the insulation, the morale things, I, I mentioned some of the facilities we're, we're, we're working on opening, um, and we'll get details out on those pretty soon as far as, as soon as we're able to, you know, we get hours on, uh, ready, ready to open and uh, get hours and processes and procedures, but, but I promise you those things are coming, um, those different opportunities. Um, it's just gonna be a little bit different than it was in the past. All right, um, so indications that th those are uh, the, most of the questions we've got right now. Um, if there are other questions, uh, please submit them and we will uh, try and uh, answer them online. Um, and uh, you know, as always, if, there are, if you do have questions or concerns, uh, you're, you're always welcome to put in ICE uh, comments. But I, I would ask, please leave contact information. Um, we, we do get back with you um, and we can provide feedback when you uh, give contact information. It is very difficult for us to do much to, to answer your questions uh, when we don't have that opportunity. So thank you for your time and be safe. Have a good evening.